Hey everyone, so today we are out in the woods and mountains of the Mendocino National Forest, uh, about directly west of Elk Creek, and we are out here doing some search and rescue training. We are training on chainsaws, we are training on winches, we are training on mountain traversing with vehicles, and we're going to be doing some drone training. So, happy to have you along. Let's go have some fun. So chainsaws might not seem like one of the cooler pieces of equipment that you'll find on a search and rescue rig, but especially when you're out here in the wilderness, it's almost a lifesaver because we've had multiple fires here in this forest and it's caused a lot of trees to be down and it's caused a lot of trees to fall across the road. So it's made travel pretty much impossible a lot of the roads without the use of chainsaws. So yeah, we have all this high tech, you know, vehicles, we have our drones, we have our GPS technology, but sometimes it comes down to just good old two stroke gas and a small chainsaw to clear the road. Winches are another almost mandatory item to have if you're gonna be going up here and exploring into mountains. You can use them to clear trees out of the way. You can use them to pull yourself out. If you get stuck, you can use them to pull someone else out if they get stuck. So we pretty much do not venture out into the mountains if we don't have a well-equipped chainsaw and a good working order winch. I have actually not really used a winch all that much. I am working on putting one onto my own personal Jeep because I'm hoping to come up here on some adventures with the wife. And uh, I don't, the last thing I want is for us to get stuck because A, that would be kind of a black eye on us. And B, I don't think my wife would ever come camping with me again if we got stuck up here in the woods. And then once we get through all of that, I am looking forward to teaching a little bit of a drone class. Just gonna come out here and throw my buddy over here off into the woods and throw a bunch of items around. It's a bumpy road. And uh, simulate someone walking off into the woods and having a um, paradoxical undressing, which is what happens when your hypothermia reaches basically its end fatal stage almost, where your body starts to feel incredibly hot. So you start stripping out of all of your clothing. So I'm gonna go out and create a little scenario for like that and kind of walk my team through it. It's a little rainy today, so I'm probably gonna throw up the M30 over the M3 and uh, show off its capabilities and teach some people on it. Yep. Well, we asked him to find trees. Yeah.
<laughs> I would have stopped like 20 feet before you did. I don't know, Mary would she would probably get on walk on. <laughs> what would you nope. have done if you'd have been in the side of the vehicle with I would have been probably white knuckled grabbing him, going, Mike, why are you killing us? What have you done? You've doomed us all. I was clenching and I was standing on solid ground over there. Come on, it is no No! Oh God, it, yeah. I can't watch. God, Mike. We're riding in uh, over by Stony Ford. Oh, the, yeah, that's by they, Stony Ford. They took uh, up in the. Uh, okay, called, gotcha. Uh, right. Forward on. So I've been listening to this audible book about people that have gone missing in the Pacific Northwest and how they will just walk around a corner and just vanish into thin air and they never find the remains or they find them in a weird place way away from their campsite and they're talking about Sasquatch and all the cryptoids and whatnot and uh, gotta admit driving through this misty burned mountainous woods it's getting me a little bit of the heebie-jeebies i mean don't get me wrong i am in love with this i this is my entire vibe i love misty mountain forests and whatnot i wish i could stay in them all the time but yeah still a little freaky Her second encounter happened in Red. Yeah, one of our last trains, we came up here. This is all we did. I think we went a half a mile into snow and all we did were cutting trees. We went through two gas powered chainsaws, completely ran those out of fuel, and one electric chainsaw. We used all the batteries on it. You guys don't get dispatched or sent out to clear roads though, right? That's no, no, it's, this is kind of a, uh, we do it because we've got to be up here. Anyways. There's one up here, but I think we can all get past it. Not even, we got one more on the right. I think it'll be all right. All right, there are more ahead? The next two, we can definitely get around. Oh. After that, I think there's one more lane in the big road, but there's, it warrants like pulling up. Walking, like I could walk no, I would, I would drive from here on out. Would, uh, would you see down there to winch? We just winch one of the ones we can get around just for fun? Probably, there's probably one of the next big ones you could absolutely winch out of the way. Okay. Cut it at that point. Yep. Park somewhere in that area and then push the other way. Yep, because that way, well, I mean, we'll sit here and burn a ton of chainsaw fuel. 
cut the entire thing up. So yeah, if we can cut it right there and let that part fall off the cliff and just pull over and winch this to the side, save plenty of chainsaw fuel. We're gonna winch from that tree up there. From that tree right there? Mm -hmm. So, the gotcha. Okay, first thing we gotta do, is put the winch in this one. Oh, wow. Cool. Okay. That way I can pull it out. Hey Mike, before you go up there, go on to take this part. So now inside your Jeep, mm -hmm. you have a strap. So we're going around that tree there. The winch line can go straight through the soft shackle. If you didn't have that thing, it would. What's on your head? GoPro. Oh, okay. Nothing to do with your drone then. Nope. Yeah. Okay. Nope, just another camera because it's it's basically That's just fun. filming anything and everything to yeah. put together a little video yeah. for anyone who missed it. And that's why it's good when you're here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you take the photos. I'm really bad at it. Oh, no, that's, I'm, I'm aware. My wife is the same way. I, I, I joke about the fact I'm my wife's social media manager. I was like, did you take photos? I'm like, mm. that has a clip. If it didn't, you would do it before. Okay. It's refreshing all my... And this is the triangle of death. Yeah, so you yeah. want to be inside that? Yeah, I mean, at least it's, at least it's not steel cable, right? No, that's better. Well, I know, but I've seen what steel cable can do when it snaps. Oh, yeah. Well, this, this is going to be a little less dangerous than steel cable, right? This drops. Good. Steel cable won't. It'll bounce. It'll come back. Oh, yeah. Well, that's so, like steel cable, you put a coat on it or something. This yep. stuff, you don't. All right. Good to know. After I just bought a steel cable uh, <laughs> winch for my Jeep. That's not what I was expecting for a controller. There we go. So then, yes. As this goes, this here is going to get tight against those branches and it's going to slump back to you. Okay. I'm going to come stand where everyone else is standing. <laughs> the thing about it when you're pulling this, you've got to watch two points. Mm -hmm. You've got to watch your tree coming and you've got to watch that one falling off the hill. Makes sense. Okay. The reason that's down real low is that's, just, that's the. Where it's closest to the ground, yeah. Closest to the ground is going to be your best pulling point. Um, if you had it four feet up and pulled the tree over, it wouldn't move that way. Well, keep some tension on until everything gets tight. That's going to probably start snapping those twigs. Yeah. All right, we're good. We're going to throw those twigs at Junior. Yeah, I know. Yeah, hey, Junior, gonna get... <laughs> you're going to get shrapnel. <laughs> but remember, you're in control of this situation. Oh, God. So yeah. if the tree starts to fall, what are you going to do? Stop. You don't want to let it fall away? It's not going to hit anything. I mean, yeah, that well, one. We don't typically want to pull trees over, but yeah. Oh god, it's just gonna spin it sideways. <laughs> I can't believe those little twigs are holding. Now, if Mike were to put that five feet up to the tree, it would have pulled that tree over. Oh, I guarantee it. So right here, we're all standing. This is not a good area either. Because if this broke up there, where's that rope coming to? It's coming this way. Right to you. Something just popped. <laughs> I think that's probably pretty good for that side though. Think? Or a little bit further? Okay. All right. Release it a little bit. We're gonna rewind that spool before we win this in. Okay, cool. So we're gonna hold tension on it. Are we ready? Is it coming to you? Cool. So you can just go ahead and hook it and cinch it up. Yeah, hey, that's the first time I've actually used one too. Not a, I've helped with them on the side by sides, but not on the Jeep. So good to know. There's so many cool little waterfall areas around here that I just want to stop and take a look at. I really need to get my Jeep set up for more mountainous travel because I need to spend a lot more time up here. Not just to become better at search and rescue and to know the land, lay the land better, but because holy smokes, this area is just gorgeous. I love this pine tree forest, but we've started getting back into kind of the mountainous oak forest as well. I saw a few oak trees over here and man, I just, it's my favorite. Snow Mountain Wilderness, we are getting close. I think this might be where we're doing our drone training. We'll find out. 
It's your big day, buddy. Oh yeah, get a sandwich, then I'm gonna figure out where exactly I wanna go hide this dude. Tim, how come you had to pick the coldest place on the hill to do a drone simulation? Play like we play, practice like we play, whatever. Not to throw Mary under the bus, but I legitimately asked where we were going, and this is the only coordinates she gave me, so this is where I based my entire life off of. So then when you got here, you shouldn't have asked Mike where you were, because you should have known where you were. Every saddle we've come across, I figured just been ivory saddle. <laughs> Every time we pull into a clearing, I'm like, hey, here's four roads. Here we go. We're at Ivory Mill. No, stupid idiot. We're not even into the Mendocino Forest yet. Oh. All right, everyone. Quick editor's note here. I hit the wrong button on my GoPro and unfortunately ended up not recording footage of me hiding clues from my training dummy. So I figured I would add in some much needed context here since I don't have the video of it. Here you can see me applying heating pads at a dummy's neck and hands to simulate thermal heat signatures. The sticky heating pads ended up not heating up all that well, but I think we figured the issue out after the training. For the training scenario, I carried the dummy up a small hill in the north search area I had previously drawn up in DJI Flight Hub 2. I discarded items along the way to leave a sort of breadcrumb trail of clues towards the dummy. In total, I dropped a slingshot, a rain jacket, a hat, a backpack, and a piece of candy in a wrapper. The trail culminated with the training dummy propped up behind a tree, mostly out of sight. This scenario was meant to be a crash course for the members, both on how pre-mission map planning can assist drone pilots in the field, as well as basic search theory using drones. For example, what a drone pilot is looking for while in the air searching for a lost individual. This was a familiarization training more than anything to show SAR members who have little to no experience with SAR drones what they're capable of and what to keep in mind when on or planning missions. Now, let's get back to it. So just finished hiding all of the clues. Unfortunately, I didn't realize my camera wasn't recording while doing that. So, so this is the Matrice 30T or Matrix, however you want to pronounce it. It is probably the top of the line search and rescue drone for consumer or enterprise right now without buying something that's going to be military grade. So this has uh, actually powered by two batteries in the back. So this has four cameras. It has an FPV camera. So you basically, that is what's gonna be, it's fixed. You can't zoom in, you can't zoom out. And whenever you move, it's gonna move the camera. So with the gimbal cameras, they're so solid smooth. It's like you're literally just kind of standing there in Minecraft creative mode and staring and then going somewhere else so and staring like that. You say that when you have to fly it and then a different thing adjusts the camera? So that has, you can fly with the FPV, which is good because that gives you an idea of how close everything is around you. Cause you will see the blades spinning in the oh, FPV camera. Hello. <laughs> First person view. The payload itself, which is what this is called. So the payload is technically the camera and everything's attached to it. So this payload is has a wide view camera, has a zoom camera that will zoom digitally up to six times and then it switches to a completely different camera and it has a lot more clear resolution and then that second camera will zoom in up to 200 times digital zoom i have been able to watch my dad two miles away in his little jeep and lock onto it because this has active tracking on it which basically means if it'll designate targets so it'll basically be like if it sees something moving it goes oh hey that's a target and you can tap onto it and lock onto it and it will sit there without you even touching the controller and watch them. So it has wide view, the zoom, then of course it has forward looking infrared radar thermal cameras on it. And then this one also comes with a laser range finder. That is what the silver part is. It has the ability to show you how far something away is, like a traditional range finder for like a rifle, but then it also has the ability to designate GPS coordinates. If I'm up there and I see, uh, and we're like, hey, we see a car a half mile out there, I can reach out, drop a GPS point on it, and I don't have to fly all the way out. This has 720 degree, uh, safety sensors on it only in tripod and normal mode if you turn into into sport mode that is basically when you want to haul ass this thing will get up to well above 50 miles an hour in sport mode but that is at your own risk there be for the grace of god go you if you crash it into something well that's your fault with normal mode except for something like cables or certain leaves and everything it'll stop this will if you're flying into normal mode it'll come and go whoop and stop itself because it has all of the sensors on it for all sides and above and below so it's pretty safe it also this one is pretty cool has a beacon on top and a beacon on bottom that you can activate it and that's what you would use for night flying it's basically just a very very bright flashing beacon that just goes flash flash so any pilots in the air can see it who here has not flown a dji drone before okay cool they all start exactly the same you have the power button you press it once and then you press it twice and you hold it down on the second time and you'll see the battery lights fly up it'll sound like a spaceship taking off does it self-checks. 
So it does self checks every time it takes off. It checks the gimbal, rotates it all around to make sure that it's good to go. And it just kind of clicks the motors. So before I take off, this is kind of just some behind the scenes information. So this actually uses GPS to show exactly where we are. I have downloaded a, set, a lot of these regions in offline maps. All of this right here, these sections I did on the computer at home using the app DJI Flight Hub 2. It is a great way of planning missions. Uh, it's also a great way, if this was hooked up to the internet, either via Hotspot or Starlink or anything like this, someone back at the command center back home could actually watch through the eyes of this drone via live streaming, where that actually is a, val a very big part of the search and rescue process for drones is having what's called a squinter. That is someone who basically, if possible, is looking at this image on a large screen TV or a computer that doesn't have glare, isn't worried about flying it, and has a lot larger, not so much resolution, but a lot more pixels to look at. Back in May when we had the um, Stony Ford Rodeo, and that's how we found the missing lady up there who walked away from her camp in the middle of the night, laid down in a ditch, was I didn't see it. Randall saw it on the big TV. He's like, hey, there's like some heat pixels way out there. What are those? And we went out there and checked it out and ended up finding her. So having having someone that can be watching in real time or close to real time and looking at it and going, hey, what's that? They're going to pick up something that the drone operator might not. So this is where kind of the command team would come in. So on Flight Hub 2, for instance, say someone went missing. So I've annotated right here, right in the middle of Iron Mill Saddle as the ICP. It's a blue diamond that will show up on the screen right here. It'll have a little diamond on the screen when I'm flying. So I always know exactly where the ICP is. I've done it into four different search areas, the North Search Zone, East, South, and West. Um, the blue line I've drawn through the middle of it is that trail that I kind of followed up there. And that's just, all of it is there to kind of help the pilot keep his bearings of where exactly he is. One of the cool things about these search zones, and I'm not gonna do it today because of the high wind and kind of weird lighting, is if we wanted to map out this search zone, say we knew someone had gone missing up here and we came up here, we're like, okay, we're organizing a search. We can get up here if we had a computer with us, like we had the command trailer, it's gonna be a multi-day search. I'd process it on there. Otherwise, we'd be able to tech, do map by simply tapping on this area and tapping on that and create mapping area and then we could fill it in basically however we wanted to it's 0.35 square kilometers it's yeah thanks and it would be able to fly over and it takes a photo facing down and it takes it one about photo every second flies over and then you can turn all those photos in what's called an ortho mosaic map also if we came out and we were saying to do a mapping area we would then have probably dozens if not hundreds of photos depending on the area that would be just a snapshot in time looking straight yeah. down that then another form of squinting that i've been reading about is coming in where someone can go through each one of those photos and look through and basically yeah. left to right top to bottom scanning for anything that they might you know the pilots might have missed to take it off every single dji drone is exactly the same you're gonna take your thumbsticks and you're gonna bring them towards you and down in a diagonal motion so like so like that what happens when you get it upside down? I try not to do that, ever. <laughs> the cool thing about this one is, so if you can, you can obviously move the drone side to side, but the gimbal itself will rotate like that. Mm. We're gonna say, for instance, we get a call out for someone. They're lost here at Ivory Mill Road. We've got a, a direction of travel. We believe they headed north. We found footprints. So we are gonna do a search headed north. And before you guys start worrying about the rain, Gonna talk over the top of myself here really quick since I got my numbers wrong in the video. The DJI RC Plus controller has an IP54 rating and the M30T has an IP55 rating. And very heavy rains. You can do practically everything with this except put it underwater. You got a winch warp on that? No, unfortunately. <laughs> so you can have the side-by-side -side cameras. So here's infrared. And then if you want infrared and zoom, you can have them side-by-side. -side, so you can be checking in infrared and zoom at the same time. That's cool. So right now, this is showing up as white hot. Okay. Okay. So I've found different, different temperatures, different settings work better. So for like the summer, using something like the hot iron setting, which shows a bunch more different colors, mm -hmm. is often better because for this one right here, in the summer, you're looking for small variations in heat. You're looking for the difference between 80 degrees and 90 degrees. But if we're doing something like where we know we're we're looking for a very wide range we know it's it's 40 degrees 30 degrees out here we're looking for someone that's going to be 90 degrees or whatnot then something like black hot 
will generally work even better than white hot sometimes because then you, everything else is going to fade out and everything warm is going to be black it's high wind how much what's the how many miles an hour is it going to be so right now it's showing my wind speed is 22 24 25 26 miles per hour right there so generally it starts getting angry around 30 miles an hour so it will show down here at the compass. It'll, sh yeah, it'll show right around. It'll show your wind speed. It'll show the direction it's coming from. You have your compass. You have your FPV camera down here at the bottom as well. When you're looking for someone from a drone, you're not so much looking for specific objects. You're looking for different colors. Something that variation. looks, ver yes, variation. Something that's different. The least common color in nature is blue. You just don't see blue in much outside of fishes or certain lizards. So if you're flying along and you see something blue, I kind of want to check in on it. See if I can remember where I left all of my clues. So unless you're right there, like you said, there's a lot of glare, whereas with the TV, I can see it probably better than you. Precisely. And this is where like, I can see one of the clues right now. If it was on a TV, it would be able to be seen. Mm -hmm. But so I mean, kind of take a look at it right now. There is a clue in this photo. Mm -hmm. So this is where you would, if you had it on a TV, you would probably see it because there's a distinct color in difference. In your green thing or just in the screen? It's uh, in the screen in general, but also in the green part. Yeah. Well, from here I see a bunch of fingerprints. <laughs> All right, do you see it now? Now that I've zoomed in? I do see a little bit of color difference, I think, at the base of the Up tree. Up in there, shit, no. That's a tree. You ever hit? It's a little black spot right there. Oh, that? Yep, oh. so it's a different color black than anything else. It's a black and yellow bit right there. So this would be very hard to see without looking on a TV, mm -hmm. but it, that right there is huh. our young lad's slingshot. Oh, really? So it's a... see the slingshot? Oh, yeah. See the black, black and yellow of the tube? See the cord on it? Oh yeah, I see it. Hmm. All right, here we go. Here's another good shot. You find a clue in this one. Yep, black and silver. <laughs> Discarded raincoat. Okay. Okay. So it's it's black. Unfortunately, yeah, we have so many trees and everything here. The black's going to be a common color, but the silver is kind of a dead giveaway of the bright. There's something bright there. All right. So you can, can you spot the clue in this one? This one's quite higher. Like I see something red right red. there. Is that the that red? red? Yep. Right? There's something red right there? Orange. Orange. That's my Carhartt shirt that I was going to wear today. Did you guys see it? <laughs> so there's a, there's an orange spot right there. So yeah, I threw, yeah. I basically carried a bunch of stuff out there and threw it out there with me. So there it is zoomed in. This one, Carhartt shirt, threw it in between the trees. So basically this whole little thing was basically simulate someone paradoxically undressing and dropping their yeah. stuff with hypothermia. Is the lad right. up there too, or just the stuff? No, he's up there. Oh. I threw everything the up there. Lad. Yeah, the lad. <laughs> All right, so there are actually two clues in this photo, but I have a feeling you're only gonna find one, if any. This is where I'm, I'm showing this because this is a great tool, but this will never replace ground teams because there's, there is a piece of evidence in this picture that only a ground team would probably pick up on because I would have to spend my entire time looking with zoom to find it. Remember what I said about the least common color in nature? See where someone's been some Brodies up there. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been up there. Schubert's hat. What is oh, it? Uh, oh, yeah. hat. Zoom back out again. <laughs> I can't see. I see the glare. <laughs> you don't see it anywhere. That's why if you, whenever I'm flying, you guys see me like hunched over. That's why, because I'm, I'm trying to defeat the glare. So the other piece of evidence, which I'm going to see if I can even find it myself on the wide view. I know exactly where I put it, but I, I did this experiment with my contractor the other day and I was like, oh, this is going to be the perfect little training exercise. And I went out and did it and I'm like, oh crap, I can't even find it. I know exactly where to place them all. Candy wrappers. It seems like you've done a lot of training with your contractor on here. Does he ever work? You sound like my wife, who goes, she actually pulled us aside one day and she goes, hey, John, Tim, I know you guys are enjoying having fun together. I know you guys are enjoying playing with the drone. He's been helping me with the parachute thing. She's like, I really want my bathtub. I'm like, okay, so we, we've stopped since then. So I threw this, this piece out. There it is. And this is where you would not 
find it because it took me forever to find it. I'm gonna zoom all the way in. So this I threw in as kind of a, you know, as we're doing our, our size up and everything. For instance, this lad, the lad, his name's the lad now, yeah. um, Aladdin. Aladdin, there we go. <laughs> he really likes Twizzlers. So the ground team could go through, yeah. potentially find Twizzlers. So what I did was hide Twizzlers out here and I would show you it on the wide view, but this is all you're gonna see. You're not gonna see it because I had to zoom in to find it. But there is a Twizzlers wrapper in here. My plan was to take a bunch of candy wrappers out and throw them around and be like, all right, now we're gonna, gonna follow them to the trail. Oh, it's, it's got Twizzlers in it. It's oh, not just well, a wrapper. Like, oh so, so Michael go up there. Michael go get it. Yeah, so there's oh, there's the Twizzlers. Okay, like I said, so here I'll, I'll zoom out and you'll see it, it's quite small. So this is where I, I remain very humble about this. Do you think so, somebody on a large screen would be able to see something like that? Possibly. Like All right, so this actually makes me happy. Let me double check something right here. Happy, I'm so happy. <laughs> Our little drone nerd. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta have one. <laughs> yep. So here we're gonna look on infrared because if I turn it over to wide, you guys will probably find it. But our missing person is in this screen. So black is gonna be the warmer senses of heat. So we're looking for black? You're looking for black. It, uh, hot pocket. I put hot pockets to him. Gotcha. Okay. I thought he was being a wimp and putting them in his pockets. Oh. No. The I'll, I'll flip it over to wide and now see if you can spot him. If this was a person, yeah, you would be... The whole body would be lit up. The whole body would be lit up. But... Yeah, I see him. Okay, let me see. You see him? I don't see him. It's in the green? Is it under that tree right there? Looks like it to me. That's, that's, that's what I would say. Yeah, okay. I thought it. Yep. So, oh, I have him. He's basically passed out against the tree. And what I was very happy to see, and I'll zoom in with this now. See, those yeah. hot spots right there. One is his head. One is, his, one is his head, one is his hand. Oh, so, yeah. where I'm talking about how this would work on an actual search, it's a slow, methodical search. It's not me just flying around going, ha 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 ha. So it's, you're gritting it. I am, following a I am when you're doing gritting, it. following pattern as best I can, and I'm also kind of doing the Superman search, where you're flying around from point to point and you're looking. And you're, you're gonna look, you're gonna stop, you're gonna go, okay, what's that? You're gonna pivot around to get a better look at it. How do you see that you're in your grid? Can you see those lines? Oh, yeah. So you see down here, it's a little bit zoomed in right now, but you see I'm still oh, in the red zone. So you're looking there. Yeah, so that's where, from a command standpoint, you guys could say, we get a call out for a search, and you're just like, okay, cool. You go in, you draw a grid. I want a map of this grid, and then I want you to search it. So I can come in, and that exact spot that you guys would put up on Flight Hub, which I'll go over how to work at that one of these next trainings. So if you had Wi-Fi here, and it's freezing ass cold up here, and we didn't want to come up here, and we stayed in the valley. You could shoot us. One hundred percent. There might there might be a little bit of a delay. So now you can put you could give us the coordinates of that dummy, and we could go up. Yep. Up the so car, we'll do that right now. Find it. Yep. So I'll, I will zoom in on him right now. There he is, and that is as simple as this button right here. It's hard to see, but there's a little diamond right there. I press that, and it has now designated that right there. So you would call those into us. We'd enter it in our phone. Yep. Drone Ops 1 is just the name of the pin. 39.5. Yeah, she's the only one that's got on the phone. She can go up there and get him too, right? 39.57. Minus 122. Yep. From where the drone is right there, he is 450 feet away. Okay, so what were those coordinates again? Oh, know. Jesus. There. What's going with me? You gotta track someone. Yep. So tap and track. So like that. So there. Now, it's literally... I'm doing nothing and it's just watching him. So you have it tracking him? I have it tracking him. So will the drone move with them then? It will, it will move a certain amount. It won't like follow them through the woods. It'll, it'll keep the camera on him until he gets lost. So at this point my GoPro ran out of battery and I didn't want to stop flying and filming in order to go swap it out. So I figured I'd do a little bit of voiceover to talk about some of the limitations and features of the camera that we're working with. The active tracking is a pretty powerful tool but has a hard time following people through dense foliage and trees. The FLIR, or thermal vision as we generally call it, has a pretty hard time picking up people through foliage as well, but not nearly to the extent I've seen people talk about. I've heard and read a lot about people saying that thermal vision is basically useless when you've got heavy dense foliage and can't see through it, but as seen through a couple of the videos I've picked up here, you can still see pretty good thermal signatures even through some dense leaves. Obviously if you're in a giant oak forest and there's no skyline available at all, you're going to have a pretty tough time picking out anyone through it, 
But there's oftentimes I've found myself being able to see the thermal signature even better than with the wide view or the zoom as seen by that side by side right there. Even while reviewing the footage for editing purposes, I can pick out the black hot thermal signatures way better than I can most of the normal view. And if it wasn't obvious, you can tell why most search and rescue members on actual callouts wear reds or oranges, because it's much easier to see them on normal view. The two search and rescue members glow like beacons on the thermal signature, but with their muted green, black, and gray clothing, they basically camouflage themselves right into the forest. From what I've seen, there's no set in stone color setting you should use for your infrared, but here's what's worked best for me. I've mentioned that I like to use the black hot and white hot settings in the winter time, where you're looking for a specific heat source in a very large area of cold. Whereas I found the hot iron and iron red settings that display a lot more colors better used in the summertime. Sometimes the amount of colors can get a little overwhelming, but that's what you need when you're trying to pick out very small temperature differences in the summertime. In the wintertime, when the difference between a human body temperature and the ambient temperature can be well over 60 to 70 degrees swing, black hot is generally what I prefer. Again, though, these temperature settings are just a matter of personal preference that I found through many hours of flying and using the thermal camera. No, well, I'm just, I'm glad you grabbed the camo backpack. I for, totally forgot to even mention that. But you had blue and yellow on it. Yeah, I know, but I completely, I completely forgot about it. I was like, eh, we should hide it right here. <laughs> no, 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 please, this is my favorite backpack. <laughs> <laughs> That's so creepy. He's like staring at you. <laughs> they aren't? No, they're not really warm. Huh. I mean, Weird. I thought they were going to feel warmer. I, I thought I... so too. That's pretty interesting though because you did see it on the thing. But they're not, to me, they didn't feel... No, they're, these are cold. Yeah. Oh, here's your Twizzler. Oh, can Mike have Yes, you can. You can have the Twizzler. These ones are still warm. Thanks. <laughs> Were they on the dummy too? They were in his pockets. So maybe that's what... No, because it showed his face. I don't, yeah. I don't know. The candy idea, that's a reward. Perfect. I thought I brought a lot more. I don't know where they all went. Thank you guys for bringing that back down, because as, as I'm hot carrying everything up there, I'm like, I am dreading coming back up here to grab this all. You know, I've been thinking about that. It looked like I'm moving in. So even when we're out here just driving around, it's still quite good training because for someone like me who does not know these roads at all, it's great to familiarize myself with them as well as familiarizing myself and all the other members with uh, their equipment because knowing that your equipment can take you up extreme terrain, you'll be a lot more comfortable. I tend to be a little more cautious when I'm out here doing stuff like this, but knowing these jeeps can handle this terrain is huge for relieving some of the worry about being this far out in the woods it might seem like we're just out here just driving around having fun having a good time which we are don't get me wrong but it's still incredibly valuable training <laughs>
bowls and uh, go change out of my soaked clothes because it was very misty up there on the mountains today and I am ready to be in warm dry clothes with a large plate of reheated macaroni and cheese from scratch. Alright, so that about wraps it up for this little day of training. Hopefully everyone enjoyed watching as much as I enjoyed filming this and putting this on. But, I'm ready to go home.